probably had some of the highest CPI prints year over year um, in decades, um, just in the last few quarters. And um, obviously markets and um, both equities and bonds are finally reacting to this uptick in inflation. Um, strangely, we aren't seeing inflation expectations priced in further out on the curve. If you look at uh, five-year five-year break-evens, they, they really just haven't budged. So I don't think investors are pricing in sustained inflation, which is interesting given I was listening to um, Vincent Deloard talk about a large study on historical inflationary periods that he conducted. He went and curated uh, inflation data from dozens of countries over the last few hundred years. And so he's got, you know, um, thousands of, um, you know, country years of inflation data as his sample. And he, his finding was that once inflation ticks above 5% for a couple of quarters in a row, five years from now, inflation is still five uh, greater than 5%. So once you sort of move into a higher inflation regime, then those get embedded both mechanically in the fact that companies are, are now feeling comfortable about raising prices. Cost of living is going up. That means that employees are demanding higher wages. So it gets priced into wages. And then finally, it gets priced into the expectations, the adaptive expectations. And people begin to believe that inflation will persist for a long time. We're clearly seeing sort of People are still in the transitory phase right now, um, and we'll start to see a shift one way or another in the longer term inflation expectations. Um, we got to just keep an eye on the five-year, five years, and see what what plays out there. But I mean, clearly, what's happened here is in reaction to the um, March 2020 lockdowns, governments. Uh, fire hose trillions of dollars into like directly into people's bank accounts. People paid off credit cards and unleashed a buying spree. So that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that at the same time, people were flush with, um, with spending money, full economies and, and production lines were shut down around the globe. And so you've got too much demand and too little supply and that's, of course, being complicated even further by um, the fact that we're moving into a deglobalization phase. Um, so globalization, obviously, highly disinflationary as you're able to migrate labor overseas. So you, all of the manufacturing gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as the um, jurisdictions with cheap labor are able to continue to bring prices lower and lower, lower until that that was exhausted largely in 2017 when China flipped its energy policy. And um, so now we're beginning to see deglobalization and actual repricing at the, at the corporate level and at the employment level. And, you know, so we're entering a very different regime here. So I think that's what motivates a timely conversation about inflation. Right. So we've got kind of a combination of both, demand and supply shocks happening sort of simultaneously combined with some pretty significant monetary inflation that in this case, unlike sort of that 08 or sort of the last commodity boom in that early knots to 08, which was, oh, there's this money being printed and, and it's all going to get into the system. It never really did. Global growth was enough to offset whatever inflation was occurring. And it wasn't actually getting through the system, but today and the largesse and the different type of uh, monetary interactions uh, along with some uh, complicating factors around supply chains and and you know demand shocks you're re you're starting to see actual uh, inflation manifesting right through to the end user the end individual and and yeah. companies and supply chains and things like that so it is a it is it seems to be quite a sea change and, it's worthwhile, uh, I think, contrasting to, to, to 2008, because I think all three of us were guilty um, of observing the unprecedented monetary stimulus 
that was perpetrated by central banks in 2008 and 2009 in response to the global financial crisis, I remember perceiving at the time that the mechanics were going to be a massive increase in M2, um, banks flush with reserves, and it's going to unleash a major um, lending boom. And that would then drive hyper, uh, you know, drive inflation. Turns out all of that stimulus was contained within the financial economy and never really trickled down into the real economy. And so what ended up happening is that you had capital restructuring of corporations was kind was sort of the primary reaction function to that, right? So companies went out, a, they borrowed a lot at low rates, but instead of ramping up productive capacity or you know, making large capital investments, instead they um, went to the debt market, borrowed, and then used that to buy back shares or issue dividends or whatever. So you had this sort of, it, it enabled this 10 years of financial engineering, right? It was very, very good for the capital owners, but didn't really do much for the real economy. And now we've got real money in real people's bank accounts, driving real demand at the same time as you have these interesting supply shock dynamics um, on, unfolding. So yeah, I think we've entered a different regime. Roger, Rod, muted. Rod, yeah, muted, Rod. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, I think we talked about this last week, but the real demand is is actually quantified by an extra 20% demand on the ports, right? So this supply chain issue that we're seeing has come from the demand side. For the most part, ports just <coughs> haven't seen that level of increased demand in the last 20 years. They're not designed for it. So there's going to be a lot of work to be done if we're going to continue to put stimulus checks in people's bank accounts and or increase their income based on um, labor demand. So, you know, th this is one of the um, another one of the key drivers that is really uh, manifesting today in the CPI numbers. But there's also the other side, which is well, what about the long term deflationary um, impetus, mm -hmm. right? The fact that we have continued improvement in technology, the demographics, you know, this is the other side of the equation is that this is only momentary. People are going to go back to work. They're going to start buying less stuff. Um, the fiscal spend isn't going to be that much. And at the end of the day, this is transitory. By the end of the year, we should be back to normal. And uh, Bob's your uncle, right? So it, it, it population plays a role in that as well. So population yeah, growth, demographics, demographics, demographics debt, yeah. um, and tech, the technology uh, sort of. Um, and I think technology plays a role longer term, but it, it's going to take a while. So you, you've got wages which are very very sticky it's hard to roll back wages and so you're going to see companies i think looking at automation uh, autonomous driving all those types of um, efforts in order to control costs and reduce costs which are, but are going to take time to work through the system you have to retrain a different labor force you have to <laughs> implement that technology you have to build it you have to build the software side you have to engineer it you have to build the, the hardware side of it it's it is a much, I think, a much longer process to, to actually uh, achieve what what might be fruitful in in gains that can offset some of the wages. So it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting. And that the other thing, and I know we want to talk about the, the concept of inflation, but also inflation volatility, right? So there's the right. there's the mean rate of inflation, and then there's variance around that mean rate, and that's a very those are very important concepts to sort of separate a little bit. And a lot of folks are talking about, you know, the 70s as the anal analogous period. And I think that's, uh, um, it's a little bit narrow sighted to do that. And, and, you know, the example that we've all talked about on multiple occasions is that post-World War II scenario where price controls were, relieved, were, were uh, uh, rescinded from a war economy. And in 1946 was the, the sort of first uh, piece of that where these price controls were removed and we had this burst of inflation and then a new equilibrium and then another burst and a new equilibrium. And so it wasn't just the inflation rate was increasing. It was this larger variance around the mean that provided more uncertainty with respect to you know these two dynamics that have a lot of play in asset class pricing, which are inflation and growth, obviously liquidity playing a role too. But that inflation expectation having a larger variance has significant impact for asset classes. 
And, you know, that there's that great piece from man that we'll be sharing. But, you know, we haven't had inflation volatility um, or, or inflation, per se, since, you know, sort of 1990. So we're, yeah. we're at 30 years of extremely low inflation and a very, very consistent and low volatility around that mean. And uh, I think that bears significant consideration as well. So